LeBron and they're finally teammates. Can Staples handle all this star power? And what do you get when you combine a former oh, water no. polo star, a meteorologist, and a social media stud? Oh yes, it's an action-packed hour of the jump. Let's go. Welcome to The Jump. I'm Rachel Nichols alongside, I mean, this is just, this is phenomenal. ESPN NBA insider Zach Lowe, his water polo youth coming back to him today. The undefeated Mark Spears, star of stage and screen. Brian Windhorst will indeed join us to talk all things Team USA in a minute. But we do want to start with a New York reunion. Woj reporting today that Kemba Walker will be brought out, bought out by Oklahoma City. And after clearing waivers, he plans to join the New York Knicks. Walker growing up in New York, of course. And as you saw in the tease, he has fond memories in MSG. The Knicks also added Evan Fournier earlier this week. Don't ever Google his last name. I'm just telling you I'm doing a public service. Meanwhile, Mark, what are your expectations for Kemba with the Knicks? Well, first, I'm glad that Zach shaved his chest in that picture. That, that, that looked good, man. <laughs> um, Kemba, but not his face today, It's not a real enough. picture. <laughs> well, you don't know. It could be. <laughs> we have connections. Well, back in two, 2019, it was, it was interesting because the Knicks put all their energy into Kevin Durant and into Kyrie Irving, and it ended up being a mistake. Meanwhile, the Boston Celtics snatched away Kemba. Kemba didn't want to go to New York alone. He yeah. actually would have liked to go there with Chris Middleton at the time, which certainly could have changed the course of the NBA <laughs> yes. at this moment if that happened. And But, you know, the Knicks had a chance before. Had that done that, hey, maybe Steve Mills and David Fisdale would still have a job. But it didn't happen. The Bronx kid is back now. And and I really, really like that uh, move of him going back home, especially if he can stay healthy. How can you not love this? A New York City legend is returning to the greatest city in the world for an arena that's going to go absolutely bonkers for him and for the team. And look, there was a lot on day one of free agency. A lot of same old Knicks. Nick, Everyone yep. likes to make fun of the Knicks. And I said it yesterday. I'll say it again today. People are way underrating this offseason. Their offseason was fine. Are any of these deals for New Orleans Noel, Alec Burks, Evan Fournier super exciting? Mm -hmm. Are they superstars? No, but they're all good players. And by the way, we can report today, all the all those deals, Noel, Burks, Rose, Fournier, team option in the last year. So those are really two plus one and three plus one for Fournier. The Knicks are fine. The most important thing for the Knicks is somewhere, somehow, a star or two, if they stay good and competent and exciting are going to strong arm their way to the Knicks someday and so the most important thing is just build on what happened last season and they've managed to do that without hamstringing their cap I think this is a good summer for the Knicks I love the Kemba move for a couple reasons first of all I just think that he is going to succeed there I understand the size issues and when they get to the playoffs and the defense and all of that stuff but I do think that team is set up for him to do well and also remember when you're talking about drawing those free agents Zach part of it that you're selling is MSG right the atmosphere the fans MSG wasn't a very fun place to play if you were the home team for a while there, right? He, uh, fans more coming to see the opponent than they were to see the team. There wasn't that excitement. We saw that excitement return to the Garden this past season. And with Kemba Walker, man, it is going to be off the chain. And that, mm. in turn, you can sell to other free agents. That, in turn, you can say to guys, look what the Garden's like when it gets rocking. Imagine if they were cheering like that. For you and I think and he got <laughs> go ahead and no and he has a two syllable first name and last name so that that's Kemba Walker, Walker. Oh, oh that's gonna be loud and and amazing in MSG and, and he I'm, fits he fits a need he, he brings really skills does. that they yeah. need he really does and and just one of the nicest guys in the league right so the idea that he gets to come home and be in a situation that's so comfortable to him I, I think everyone around the NBA is just happy for Kemba and, and happy yeah. for this fit. I do want to get to the team that eliminated New York in the playoffs. The Hawks bringing back restricted free agent John Collins. That's a five-year, $125 million extension, according to Woj. Collins averaged just under 18 points, seven rebounds, while shooting 40% from three for Atlanta last season. And Zach, as we see the moves made from the other East contenders, 
The Hawks appear to be running it back with largely the same group. Where does Atlanta sit for you in the pecking order in the East? I like this deal for John Collins, by the way. There's been a lot of, is he a center? Is he a four? What, what can you do to fit? You know what he's becoming? A basketball player. Yeah, a really good basketball player who can fit in lots of different lineups and do lots of different things. He's improving every part of his game. Where they rank, I would probably slot them in same where they were this season, kind of in that four or five. I mean, uh, Brooklyn, Milwaukee, I love what Miami did in Philly. I mean, it's like a big TBD with Philly. We don't know what they're going to be. And then Atlanta's right there. And by the way, that sounds like I'm, I'm denigrating them because they made the conference finals. I'm not. They're a really good team. The top of the East is really good. They're going to have a puncher's chance to replicate what they did last year. And they're just going to keep getting better. We haven't even talked about Kevin Herter. Cam Reddish showed out the last couple playoff games. DeAndre Hunter was injured most of the year. They got a lot of guys that are all getting better. And there's my guy, Clint Capella, too. Well, Trey's going to be mad at me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do think that the, the Hawks are better, but nobody's sleeping on the Hawks anymore. They're going to be ready for them. But I like Brooklyn better. I like Milwaukee better. I definitely like Milwaukee, Miami better. At this point, I like Chicago better. Ooh, Philly, spicy. Philly, like I said, is, is a TBD. But, hey, depending on what happens with Ben, you could like that better, them better. And Indy's not bad either, although I'll put Atlanta. So, yeah, I, I see them as a playoff team. But, man, the East is a beast. And um, I, I, I see them more in the middle of the pack than close to the front. Look, I think being one of the final two making the Eastern Conference Finals is really hard. And a lot has to go right in your yeah. run to get there. So I just hope that the fans in Atlanta don't look at it as a step back if they don't get quite as far this coming season. It doesn't necessarily mean it's some huge step back for the franchise or things have to be retooled. You're going to have to just see how the season goes and use your eyes and see if they play in a way that you feel like they're still growing. And maybe they do get to the Eastern Conference Finals again, but if they don't, I'm not sure for a team that was arriving early last season, mm -hmm. if they're more on time this season, anybody should penalize them for it. So I'm very curious to see what they do, but I'm glad that they gave, the con they, they gave John Collins that contract. I think it's a good fit for them. And I want to get to Chicago, Mark, the team that you think you are stacking above them. DeMar DeRozan reportedly joining the Bulls on a three-year, $85 million sign-and-trade deal from San Antonio, joining, of course, Lonzo Ball, Alex Caruso on the Bulls, in addition to Zach Levine, Kobe White, the Bulls also have Nikola Vucevic from the trade deadline, Lori Markkinen's situation, still undecided there. He's a restricted free agent. Mark, you have some intel on how the Bulls were able to sway DeRozan to choose Chicago. Can you share that with us? Yeah, uh, DeMar DeRozan's agent, Aaron Goodwin, who, who's a contract master, <laughs> <laughs> he, he basically told teams at the beginning of free agency, if you're really, really interested in getting DeMar, Bring your butt to L.A., meet with them face to face, and I'll be there with you. Well, Mark Eversley, the Chicago Bulls GM, was like, hmm, let me get this United flight to L.A. <laughs> and went there. And look, he and DeMar have a history that go back to their days with the Toronto Raptors. They know each other really well. He sat on DeMar's couch for two hours, talked to him and sold him on what the Bulls could be with him. And where did DeMar ultimately go? There were some other teams. They wanted to do some computerized Zoom kind of stuff. I think going face to face with DeMar certainly meant more. The Lakers and the Clippers also were interested in that. Obviously, that was a shorter uh, route, even though traffic in L.A. is bad. <laughs> but Mark Eversley, man, he, he went and sold the Bulls and got his old buddy to come to the Windy City. I think this, I, I, I've seen a lot of, oh, DeMar DeRozan doesn't shoot threes. He's going to take the ball out of Zach Levine's hands. What is he going to be doing when Zach Levine has the ball and Nick Vucevic is posting up? I think offensively, this is going to work mm -hmm. really well because DeMar is not just standing there doing nothing. First of all, he was 11th in the league in assists last year, which people don't realize he's a good playmaker. Mm -hmm. Levine is going to get easier buckets playing off of him. Vucevic is going to get easier buckets playing off of him. And DeMar is just a heady player. He gets in the mid-range. He cuts. He can post up and find people. They're going to have to work out some kinks but offensively I think they're going to be really dynamic my questions are number one how is this team going to be even close to average on defense and if you're not close to average on defense you're not going to do anything serious and number two for as bad as the Bulls have been since the Jimmy Butler trade, their young core, and I'm talking young, like right. Zach Levine's prime, Alex Caruso, I thought was a good signing, is prime. Their young guys are basically down to Lonzo Ball, also a signing I really liked, Kobe White, and Patrick Williams, who I'm really high on, but he's just turned 20, I think, and that's and Markin and may or may not stay. We'll see. 
that you'd like to have a little bit more of a young young core set in place when you've been rebuilding for this long, kind of like what the Hawks have, like so many guys. But I think this team's going to be really dynamic offensively. My question is, just how good can they really get? Have they traded all this draft equity, two picks for Vucevic, another pick out the door for DeRozan? Have they traded all of that for two guys who are in their early 30s who raise your floor but not your ceiling? But you know what? After so many years in the doldrums, let's have some fun. As I say, they haven't come near to hitting that ceiling in so long. I don't think you can be that picky. I think what you do need is a raising of the floor. It kind of goes back to not every team is going to make the Eastern Conference Finals. Not every team is going to make the finals. And I know there's this idea in the NBA that being stuck in the middle is some sort of purgatory. But when you have a fan base that is rabid as the Chicago Bulls fan base can be, that has had so little just playoff success for so long, don't you just want to get there this coming season? Shouldn't that be something that you make an effort to do? You just think that that's a waste if you're not hitting No, the- absolutely. Nobody said it's a waste. I just feel like maybe they've surrendered a little too much of their future to build a team that can top out as a mid-tier playoff team. But again, that's fine. And those guys, by the way, Levine, DeRozan, Vucevic, they're, they've all been all-stars recently. That's three all-stars. You have three all-stars on a team who are really dynamic offensive players. I think they're going to be solid. I just wonder what sort of the path to more than solid is. But again, that's fine. Let's have some fun. Let's have Benny the Bull throwing popcorn around in big games and going crazy. Let's have a little fun. It's been a few. Let's say it's a second round playoff exit. It's been a few years, thank you. I think the Chicago Bulls fans would like that. Mark, I know we've talked about the Pat Riley quote, right? Winning in misery, that's it. But but do you feel, I'm talking to Mark, do you feel that that goal of maybe just having a good playoff showing is a good starting point for this franchise? Yeah, no, I mean, they're they're capable of beating anybody on any given night now. And you you just showed their bench. Mm -hmm. That bench is a really, really good bench. And so I think they'll give them a boost as well. It'll be the same way we see it being electric in MSG. We'll see it being electric in, in the Bulls arena as well. So I'm excited. And, and I think Vucevic the kind of player we don't respect enough. He's a 20 and 18 kind of guy. He's been a perennial all-star. But since he doesn't do, you know, backflip dunks and his game's <laughs> not pretty and everything, he's not crossing people over, uh, that, that what he does goes by the wayside. But he's – as good as most centers, if not better than most centers in the league, maybe perhaps the best next to uh, Joker. Uh, so um, that's a claim, by the way. <laughs> Joel Embiid might have something to say about that. <laughs> his, I mean, his, like I said, he's not as fancy, and he's not screaming and yelling and smacking the floor and all that. But he he puts some great numbers in, and uh, I think we need to respect what he does more. Well, we'll find and out. Yeah, Joe Joe Embiid. Yeah, he's he's amazing. Um, <laughs> But let's let's uh he, he, he's elite and uh but Vucevic let's look at his numbers and respect him too. Absolutely. Okay. We'll see what he can do with this new crew. All right, in just two minutes, Mark is going to tell us about one of the worst ba- shots he has ever seen in the Aww. game of basketball. That's first who is in Tokyo and in no mood because I have gotten him up at four in the morning. <laughs> is that about what time it is there, Brian? Well, it's it's four in the morning now, but I didn't just get up, Rachel. You know, it was a little while ago. It, it takes so. a while to look hey, like that. I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we normally play Where in the World is Brian Winhorst, and I don't have to do that right now because I know for a fact you were in Tokyo, Japan. You watched Kevin Durant pour in 29 points to lead Team USA to the medal rounds, that quarterfinal win over Spain. Team USA will now face a formidable Australia team in less than 12 hours. Patty Mills on that one. And the USA women's team just beat the Australians in their quarterfinal matchup. So, Brian, what are the keys for the men's team as they prepare to take on their version of USA versus Australia? Boy, get Kevin Durant whatever he <laughs> you can to make him nice and comfortable. Search Tokyo for his favorite food. Make sure he's well-rested because he is the driver of this team right now. I mean, they're getting some good play from some other guys, but Durant has been huge in the last couple of games, and they're going to need him in this one. This is the best team Australia has ever had. Hmm. I would say they've been building towards this game today for a decade. And so you understand Australian basketball, they have finished fourth four times. They've been dreaming of a chance to win a medal and beat the U.S. This is their opportunity. They have got, the Americans have got to be ready right out of the gates. You know Patty Mills is going to go full bore. You know Matisse Thibel, who is going to be out there defending Durant, is going to give all of his energy. It's going to be a really intense game. You mentioned Patty Mills. Of course, there's a little subplot there facing who is now his former coach, Coach Pop. And he added drama there with Patty joining the Nets. Do you expect any sort of fun, funny moments? 
Rachel, this entire situation is absurd because <laughs> over the last couple of days, Greg Popovich hasn't just been trying to get the U.S. team ready. He's been negotiating with two different Australian players. One, Patty Mills, who's mm -hmm. had for 10 years, and Patty moved on to the Brooklyn Nets. But he signed Australia's starting center, Jock Landale. He signed him yesterday, or, you know, whatever, committed to him. He's been pitching him. And, you know, there were several NBA teams that wanted Jock. He's going to be the next, uh, you know, big Australian player to play in the NBA. He signed a two-year deal with the Spurs yesterday. So while he's running his team through the paces and preparing them for Australia's big men, who, by the way, are good and can cause problems, he's, on the other hand, signing and trying to say, hey, come play for me at the Spurs. I asked him about this, and he said, I am not sleeping. I am not eating, and you know how much Pop likes his dinner. Yeah. And he goes, I'm basically either coaching or on the phone. So this is just an outrageously ridiculous situation, but that's where we are here in Tokyo in this one-off bizarre year. Jacques could have just waited to see how the game went for you tonight and just said, huh, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Then I'll decide whether to sign or not. You want to throw in a win, but it will be a lot of fascinating subplots going on during this game. And if the U.S. advances, Brian, who do you think Team USA would rather face in a potential gold medal matchup? We've got Luca's Slovenian team or Rudy, Rudy Gobert's France squad on the other side of the bracket. Yeah, so this is a great question uh, because the French have beaten the Americans the last two times they've played, including last Quite week. recently. <laughs> and Evan Fournier, the I can't even say the newest New York Nick, uh, the second newest New York <laughs> Nick, um, has just killed, killed us, Rachel, both two years ago in China and then this summer, he just killed us. And so I know that like you're thinking about like Luca who has been the, the MVP of the, of, the, of the Olympics so far, although let's see how Kevin Durant finishes out. But by the way, Zoran Dragic, not uh, Goran, his mm -hmm. brother Zoran, uh, that's not a joke, has been awesome. I know Luca is getting all of the attention, but Zoran has been slaughtering opponents. Um, they won in the quarterfinal round, like they won by 40 because Zoran was killing. So I think they would probably take their chances with dealing with Zoran and Luca as opposed to dealing with the French again. But that's going to be a heck of a game after the Americans play the Australians later today. Such good stuff. And of course, one of the now time honored Team USA traditions is recruiting, right? We've seen so many relationships grow <laughs> out of Team USA, turn into super teams. That is, of course, how Chris Bosh, Dwayne Wade, and LeBron James became close. It is how KD and Kyrie became close with DeAndre Jordan as well. And they, of course, ended up as Nets. We've seen other relationships form. So who is doing the lobbying right now on this Team USA? Any budding relationships we should be paying attention to? Well, Draymond Green and Damian Lillard are buddies. Uh, they love to hang out with each other. They love to play with each other. And I know that, you know, you may be making an assumption like, oh, that means that the Warriors are going to try to get Dame. I'm not so sure. It's the, I think Dame would like to get Draymond to the Blazers. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure well, you know, which is which. But they really the like playing with each other. Yeah. But, but one guy I'm going to tell you who is loving this experience and I don't, I don't know who he's bonded with, but I'm just going to tell you to put this file this away. Zach Levine is loving this experience. And by the way, he's playing really well. And um, the opportunity to play with this kind of talent, he is, his, in my view, he's elevated his stature in, during this process. Uh, and I know the Bulls just made a couple of big additions, and they, you know they're probably going to have a step forward year. But he is going to be a free agent in a year, and he's now played with a whole bunch of great players, and he knows now what it's like to play with great players. So I am I can't predict what's going to happen, but I suspect this experience is going to have an impact on Zach Levine one way or another. Well, Zach has certainly shown through the years his work ethic is there. Wanting to get better is there. He has been waiting for opportunities like this, adjusting to coach after coach after coach. So I imagine being in this kind of environment has really made an impression on him. Thank you so much, Brian. We really sincerely appreciate the early wake up and we'll be watching <laughs> your coverage of Team USA in the semis later on. Thank you so much for joining us. 
Enjoy your Wednesday afternoon. I had mine a long time ago. Exactly. And shout out to our producer, Tony Florkowski, with you as well. Everyone else stick with us because coming. Olympics, one of the best friends that I have. It's 17 years in. I remember sitting in, you know, in New Jersey in high school about to play him for the first time. Like, we're, we're here 17 years later, still doing what we do, you know, and what we love. Welcome back to The Jump. That was awesome to live through and look through, and especially that moment of LeBron at Melo's first playoff game and putting the Nuggets jersey on really stresses how far back these guys go. I'm Rachel Nichols back here with Mark, with Zach, finally teammates again here at The Jump, and then Melo and LeBron teammates on the NBA stage. Just one of the many moves the Lakers made this week. In addition to Melo, the Lakers added Dwight, Trevor Ariza, as well as an injection of youth in Malik Monk. Everyone really liked that signing, Kendrick Nunn. And of course, LA picked up Russell Westbrook in a draft day trade last week. Among the additions for the Lakers are six players age 32 or older. That is actually a record for a single offseason. That's why we're all talking about it so much. And depending on how they fill out their roster, they could end up with the oldest team in NBA history. Mark, has adding Monk, Nunn, and bringing back Taylor Horton Tucker offset any of those age concerns that you might have had with the Lakers? Uh, you know, outside of Mark Gasol, because I'm not sure what Mark's going to be doing after the Olympics, uh, I'm not worried about this team. Age is nothing but a number. Look, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> you showed those old Carmelo videos. He's in much better shape now than when he came to the Nuggets. I guarantee you that. So I think a lot of the guys that they added, you know, outside of Westbrook, well, I mean, how much are they going to be playing? Like, what, 10 to maybe 25 minutes a game? It's not like you're asking Melo to play 35 minutes a game anymore. So I, I don't know that their age will matter, but their experience certainly will matter. And then you got guys like Trevor and Russ coming home, and, and, and it's going to mean a lot to them to be playing in their backyard. I, I'm not. I'm. I know there's all these memes and people are making fun of it. And I saw David Allen Greer had something hilarious about the age today, but age is nothing but a number for this team. I think they're going to be just fine, and the young guys are just some other pieces for the future. Look, they traded three rotation players for Russell Westbrook. We don't know what's happening with Dennis Schroeder. Barely heard his name, and that Westbrook trade left them with very few tools to get players. They did the absolute best they could do with those tools. I'm actually shocked how many guys they got. They got some older veteran shooters, Wayne Ellington, Ken Bazemore. They got a two-way guy like Trevor Ariza who plays both ends pretty well. And then to your point, Rachel, the Malik Monk, Kendrick Nunn, retaining Taylor and Horton Tucker. They got youth. Taylor and Horton Tucker is a different kind of slasher player that they don't really have. Kendrick Nunn, 36 career, 36 percent career from three. Good secondary ball handler. The only negative, I think, is losing Alex Caruso because he's a solid player on both ends of the floor. That might have been a luxury tax thing. But to get those young guys, some veteran guys, I just think it's a home run given how few tools they had. My question now becomes, all these names, they look good. They shoot threes well. Who do you trust defensively to be on the Man. floor late in a game in the conference finals, in the finals, against the very best offensive teams in the league? Is Lane Ellington going to be out there? Is Kent Bazemore going to be out there? Is THT going to be ready? Malik Monk has no experience in big NBA games. That, to me, is now the biggest question about this Lakers team. But you know what? Every team faces questions. Every team in the West faces questions. Two key teams, the Clippers and the Nuggets, are missing star players for some or maybe all of the season. Everyone's got questions. These answers the Lakers came up with after the rest trade are the best possible answers they could have come up with. Well, I got to look at Frank Vogel's track record on that last question, though, too, with about the defense, because if you look at his first season as head coach, a bunch of the guys that they had on the roster going into that season, let's just be honest, their defensive numbers were not good at all. A lot of guys had sort of fallen off, had defensive reputations, but if you looked at their numbers for the previous season or two, it really looked like a soft point in their strategy. And Frank Vogel got in there and he incentivized guys to play better team defense. LeBron, frankly, played better defense than we had seen him play in years. Once he started working with Frank, Anthony Davis bought in defensively. And those two players set a tone that trickled down to the rest of the players. And we took a look here on the jump of the numbers in the season or two before these guys all got together. Their defensive numbers were really lacking and they had turned into one of the best defenses in the league. And this past season, they held on to that number one defense in the league mark for quite some time. So I'm going to extend them the credit this time that even if some of those guys have not had the strongest defensive numbers coming in, 
that team culture could still be there. We'll have to see if it happens. Now, of course, with all of the former Lakers becoming Lakers again, we've had other former Lakers. Uh, Nick Young tweeted out that he wanted, don't forget about me, he said. <laughs> he wanted to come. And I do think this is, of course, uh, more of a joke. But I will say, when you talk about being stunned, Zach, that the Lakers were able to fill around the edges this way, I think this is the L.A. advantage, right, Mark, that we hear some of the other teams complain about, that they have such a sort of carrot here of, well, you're going to come play for the Lakers, you're going to live in Los Angeles, that'll make up for some of the money, right? And you're going to play with LeBron. I mean, that's the big thing. Uh, you know, LeBron, it should get, uh, if, if there's a GM of the year award that goes to Polinka, Le LeBron should get some of that because <laughs> I'm sure he's making calls, one. Uh, but but he's the marquee draw, him and Anthony Davis. So he could get the elite at the end of their careers to they take these minimum deals and, and join forces with them, guys that want to win a championship. And to the, to the rich goes the spoils. I mean, the Golden State Warriors were getting guys like this. You know, Brooklyn is, is getting guys, you know, this way. So uh, that, that's typical for the big market teams that are, are successful. But the Lakers putting on that uniform, you know, it's, it's, it's really, really special. And to do it with LeBron and, and knowing that they have a, a strong chance to be a championship team, if you're going to take a pay cut, that's the place to do it. And it's not just LeBron as a player. You know, we all know LeBron. If you're an outside shooter, mm -hmm. he's going he's gonna to feed you good looks all the time. What does it mean for a young player like Malik Monk or Kedrick Nunn? It changes the entire perception of you when you're playing in the conference finals and the finals and you're making big shots. And they, these guys have an opportunity to do that the whole world is watching. The whole league is watching. It's not a January game for the Charlotte Hornets. These guys have a chance and see a chance to change the way everybody feels about them, to come to, to give themselves an opportunity to play in moments they've never played in before. That's a big part of it, too. Yeah, absolutely. And they also, I would say, you know, David Fisdale going there. You've had coaches, and I remember Brian Shaw saying this in the past. When you're assistant coach for the Lakers, it's better than, and Mike Brown has said this, too, it's better than some head coach jobs in the league. So a guy like Fisdale coming there is certainly going to help him perhaps get a job next summer in the same way that it helped uh, Jason Kidd. Absolutely. And, of course, the same is becoming true in Brooklyn, right? The Nets lost Jeff Green to the Nuggets, but they brought back Blake Griffin. They brought back Bruce Brown. We talked in the last segment. They added Patty Mills, James Johnson, to the roster. Zach, we're seeing players want to go there for some of the same reasons you were just talking about with the Lakers. Do you think their moves are a little closer to a title than they were before free agency started, or it's just about the big three and whatever else they do is kind of set dressing? Yeah, if, if they were my favorites to win last year. If all the three stars were healthy, they looked like they were going to win last year when all the three stars were healthy. They lost Jeff Green, but I think these series of moves you just highlight. I think Patty Mills is a great fit there. He's insurance at point guard. He's perfect to play off somebody like Harden and Kyrie handling mm -hmm. the ball up top. A great spot-up shooter. And don't sleep on the James Johnson one because they can use him yeah. just like they use Bruce Brown as a center basically screen roll and he's better at that than Bruce Brown he's a good playmaker he's got more experience doing that he may not have the perfect floater Bruce Brown's got that perfect yeah. floater yeah. but James Johnson and he's bigger stronger a more versatile defender like don't sleep on that one the Nets have done really well for themselves and I think right now the buzz is Lakers, 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 and that's great. The Lakers are going to be awesome. I think the Nets are the favorites to win the championship again, and I and I don't even know if that's debatable. Yeah, yeah, I, I think they could add another big. I did like how Claxton improved uh, during the playoffs, looked good. So did Brown. The team's still a little bit small, could use some more defense and rebounding, but if these three stars are healthy, man, like that to <laughs> me is the question. Are, are they going to be healthy? With all due respect to the Bucks, we all know that if they were healthy, right now. Well, look, there certainly are going to be, I think, the betting favorite going into next season. They're going to be the favorites of a lot of our analysts here going into next season. I love the Patty Mills pickup, the championship experience, just the way he too. is able to fit with all of those different pieces. And you talk about the bigs. I thought Nick Claxton had a fantastic season all the way yeah. around, and his continued development is going to be really fun to watch. And that's the other thing with teams like this. You get to watch those younger players get better and better. I always say running it back is never really running it back. Older guys get... Well, they get older and younger guys get better, and that's just the way it is. So we'll have to see what develops for the Nets. Here's what the jump record is. Yeah. Like, say it mid crank. How does, mid -crank. It, how does it work? That's good. What do you got? Uh, a, close, a source close to the situation Doug McDermott to the Spurs, three years, $42 million. By the way, Can you interrupted me for that. 
<laughs> well, it's news. It's something. <laughs> You're throwing the poop emoji at Doug oh, McDermott. Man. That is uncalled for. I just want to show you guys are okay. I, I don't know. Can we can we get one of these? Are we can, no? Can, can you send me one of those to my house? Uh -huh. I'm just gonna take that wherever I go in life. I can usually for one of our. <laughs> yeah, there you go. How do you Give like me that? Back, How do you Give like me that? Back. <laughs> Doesn't have quite the ferocity that Mark had to like punch that. No, all right. Uh, let's talk a little bit, Warriors. Well, we'll talk after the show, Mark. Uh, Golden State did not make any drastic moves to their roster so far this summer. They kept their picks in the draft. They did extend Steph Curry to the tune of four years, two hundred fifty million dollars, which is no small thing, of course. Keeping Curry under contract until he turns age thirty-eight. Now, adding on to his current deal, Steph's extension guarantees him. $261 million through 2026, including nearly $60 million in that final season. I'm just going to say that again. The man's going to make $60 million. Just round up and let's call it 60. I, I, I am. Better. That is what up. I have done. Yeah. I mean, look, if you are making 59.6, 60. It's 60, basically. <laughs> um, Mark, what do you see with the way the, the Warriors are building this roster? How much longer can they maintain the strategy of paying Steph, Clay, and Dre big money while they also figure out how to add around Steph or build for the future, which they're kind of trying to do both? Well, we're, first of all, Steph is worth every penny. Amen. That sixty million dollars when the when the Warriors' current ownership bought the team was what four hundred and fifty million dollars, and now it's worth two billion. They're doing okay. Yeah, they'll be able to pay that. <laughs> um, keep an eye on Kelly Oubre. Okay. He's talking about his situation, but he may still need a sign and trade to get the money that he wants. I know his agent is working dilig diligently trying to give him above fifteen mil. The Warriors probably will need to help him get that. Keep an eye on Kaminga tonight. He makes his debut on ESPN2, I believe, along with Moody. I think Kaminga's going to be able to help them now. Wiggins is going to be a great third score for them. Wise man, I saw him jumping and down, dancing after a bucket last night in Summer League, which means he's probably on the mend and getting better. I think the Warriors are fine. But some additions still could be underway, possibly uh, with Igadala and in a sign and trade with uh, with uh, Ubre. Amen to what Mark said at the beginning. Give Steph all the money. All of this, everything that's happened to the Warriors starts with Steph Curry. The five billion dollar valuation <laughs> that he talked about. The new arena that's going to print money. It all is possible only because of Steph Curry. He is the Tim Duncan of the Golden State Warriors. It starts and ends with him. Give him whatever he can get. As for the team, look, I think they're going to be really good, but it really just depends on Clay. You know, is, is Clay going to come back? When does he? We know he's coming back. Right. When? What condition will he be in? How long will we see before we see a prime peak, Clay Thompson? But everyone, you know, they made these picks at seven and fourteen, and there was all this hubbub about. Oh, I guess the Warriors are. Are going young and Joe Lacob, the, the governor, said, Yeah, we're, we're happy to bridge the gap like this. These decisions don't just stop. Right. Like, these, it doesn't mean that they've stopped looking for trades. That they're, if Bradley Beal becomes available or Star X becomes available, the words is out. Simmons. If, wh whoever it is, they're, they're going to keep looking around and keep looking. And Steph Curry made some comments to Marcus Thompson of The Athletic mm -hmm. yesterday after signing his extension about, Yeah, I, I want to be involved in those conversations. As long as we're doing everything we can to win, I'm happy. If not, we have issues. So this isn't a static situation. It's not done. They're going to see what opportunities come up. And in the meantime, see how ready Wiseman, Moody, and Kaminga, et cetera, are to contribute now. And this is a team where that maxim of, hey, the NBA is not just ordering off a menu comes true, right? The idea that, oh, can't they go out and get someone on Steph's timeline? That player has to be available. Now, we just talked about the Bradley Beal tweet. We don't know what that means. Maybe he's more available yeah. than we thought. We'll find out. But certainly a guy like Steph Curry, there's a handful of players in the NBA. Steph is certainly one of them who are actually underpaid. I mean, as crazy as that is, when you're talking about making $60 million, when you talk about how much revenue they bring in, they are actually underpaid because we have a salary cap in this league. And Steph is one of the very few that you will be able to say that about no matter how much money he is making. And not only that, his first extension coming in at just $11 million a year because of all those ankle troubles that yep. seem like it, that allowed them 
to keep building the team the way they did it. It allowed yes. them to have the flexibility to keep loading up. Like it, People forget that because it seems like ancient history, but that was a big, big deal. No, I mean, the confluence of events, having the Steph Curry friendly contract because of the ankle issues, obviously the cap spike in 2016. That is how they got Kevin Durant. That led to a couple more titles. So there is no question that this team has had great fortune at times in this past decade. Now they are running into, hey, is this going to break for us? Is that going to break for us? But as guys said, 